Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Nonviolence International's YouTube channel. This is our spotlight series where we talk with activists, scholars, and advocates leading the way in global action. My name is Rachel, and today I have the pleasure to interview a world-renowned artist and puppeteer, David Solnit. David has been described as activism's Renaissance man, the co-founder of Art and Revolution, and encourages movements with participatory activism and performance. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me today, David. Thank you so much, Rachel and Nonviolence International. I'm a fan of your work. Thank you, David. During this interview, I would like to cover three important aspects of your activism. The creative process behind images and symbols for nonviolent movements, the role of art and activism and how it connects people, and of course, its application in major global shutdowns, including successes like at the World Trade Organization in Seattle. During our discussion, we're gonna be referring to art. Can you start by explaining the varied nature of art activism and the different forms of art someone might see during a social movement? Sure. Uh, I use the term art or actually arts with an S. And by that, I mean all the different uh, ways we communicate through uh, the range of art. So, you know, visual arts like paintings, drawings, uh, banners, flags, but then also, uh, uh, musical arts, singing, uh, playing music, and then also performance, uh, dance, theater, that type of thing. I, I often think that at the end of the day, all we have uh, at, our, uh, at our disposal to change the world is uh, our voice, our bodies, and the things we create with our hands. So those are the, the three different ways we can create arts to communicate. And so that's that's what I think of my arts, though I focus a lot on uh, visual art and sometimes street theater. I, I try as much as possible to collaborate with artists and also with performers or with musicians and also performers. I love that. And how did you get started in applying puppeteering and storytelling to activism? Well, uh, I was very drawn towards creating art as a young person and uh, considered being a professional artist and, you know, trying to go to art school and that kind of thing. But I also saw that there was a lot wrong in the world. Uh, you know, my generation was uh, confronted with a, a second wave of draft registration for a possible military draft. We thought there would be a war for oil in the Middle East in the late 70s and early 80s. So that got me active. Uh, and I didn't see how uh, formal art you know, showing paintings in a gallery type of stuff would contribute to making change in the world. So I worked most of my life doing construction to support my uh, organizing. But then after 10, 15 years of organizing and social movements, I realized we needed different ways to communicate uh, and express ourselves and resist. And so I started to invite artists and performer friends to work with uh, work with me in organizing demonstrations and that type of stuff. And so after years of that, I realized that, okay, I wanna actually help do that part too. I don't wanna just organize the artists to come in, but I want to be part of that process. So, so that both, uh, so I come at arts as an organizer because I feel like they're tools that uh, are key to help us win, that we understand the world through stories that arts can be the most powerful way to tell stories. And so if we, if we want to uh, you know, shift consciousness, win public support and win our campaigns, uh, art can be really the, the cutting edge. And it's also counters uh, how uh, elites keep people down, which is through uh, somewhat parallel efforts of propaganda and media manipulation, public relations, uh, often using images and narratives, but based on a, on you know advertising uh, and manipulation techniques rather than you know the the art and narratives that I try to lift up are coming directly from people's lives. So as a strategy, what role is that art that you're organizing, that you're connecting with people? What does that do in creating momentum? Uh, I mean, there's there's uh, it works at on a bunch of different levels. Partly. Uh, how we understand the world. Uh, uh, one of the artists that uh, I'm a, a big fan of, uh, 
His name Ricardo Levens Morales and has been using art and social movements as both an artist and an organizer for decades. And I'll just quote him because he says it so well. That he says, uh, humans are story driven. We make choices according to how we understand the world to be. Art speaks directly to those inner spaces where the stories are stored. I use art to support people's ability to believe in possibilities that go beyond the boundaries that are acceptable to the rulers. So really, uh, art is, uh, the arts can help, help us uh, amplify our stories. And you know, one way to understand social struggles is through a, a battle of stories or narratives. And so if you want to win, uh, if you want to win public support, community support, you need to uh, articulate your story and your narrative. And you also need to be able to be conscious of how your opponent tells a story that tries to, to divide people, to diminish people, to make you feel powerless and both understand their stories and counter it, combat it and tell a more powerful story. And I think we have, we have the edge because, uh, stories of people's movements are rooted in our lived experience in our communities, as opposed to, you know, professional propaganda and public relations firms. Yeah, absolutely. And so how do you, how do you train for art activism? Do you have, are you solely making the art? Are you with others who are making art? Well, I, to me, it's just, uh, there's a couple level. I think, uh, I think everybody, has the skills to make art, uh, you know, just like I work, the musicians and uh, song leaders I work with believe everyone can and should sing as they do in so many cultures. And as activists and organizers, we advocate that everyone should be involved in uh, making change and controlling their community. So similarly, I believe uh, while there's a role for skilled and professional artists that everyone can and should make art and that, uh, you know, and many of us have these skills. If you, if you sew, garden, cook, uh, woodwork, all these different things, uh, you know. And throughout, throughout, uh, I think our species has always uh, had a very special place in our lives of making things together, whether it's songs, dances, food, shelter, uh, you know, uprisings, festivals, and so I, I think. Uh, having art play a very central place in social movements, I think uh, builds this, builds strong bonds uh, between us and also makes, uh, makes our movements more enjoyable. And to me, it also uh, points to how I want the world to be, which is one in which we, we create our own culture and uh, make our own art. And it's not something separate that we consume, but something that we co-create. Um, so practically what that means is, you know, leading up to a mobilization or as part of a campaign the places and i can talk about this in the wto example but uh we use art to to talk about the issues and the struggles and to tell the story of them and you know a lot of people learn in a different a lot of different ways some people learn visually some people through experience some people uh can read or listen and so art can hit a bunch of those different uh ways of learning and uh, I'm a visual learner, so you know if you talk to me, you know I'll listen. But if you can show me something or give me powerful images, that will uh, make make a big difference to me. Um, so there's using it for education, using it to involve people before a mass mobilization. We'll often have giant art builds and involve people in creating the art that we'll display or per practicing the songs or music or. Uh, lately, we've been doing a lot of street murals, so we have people practice their street mural skills and design skills, you know, and, and with the street murals, we've been doing mass ones where we take over whole city blocks and invite different groups in the community to design a mini mural within that of a solution. So then that group who may or may not see themselves as artists learns how to translate their ideas into images, how to lay out a mural and how to paint it on the street and involve other people in their group. So it's all uh, uh, great tools for involving people and scaling people up to tell their own stories. Yeah. And then, I, yeah. There's different tools in nonviolent protest. 
and maybe protesting isn't for everyone. So art has this way of bringing together people in a different way that isn't per se, you know, sit-ins or strikes. Um, it's it's anyone can be involved in art. Right, and uh, you know, and the the sit-ins, the strikes, the disobedience, and the direct action are one piece of it. But you also need education. You need movement building. Uh, you know, you may need to go and uh, go to public hearings or meetings, or you know, there's a whole bunch of different levels for people to be involved with. But you know, we also do need the 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 mass direct action involving lots of people and art can play a, a powerful role in, uh, you know, when we do a direct action or a disobedience, we're, we're waging a confrontation with our opponents. And if we do it well, uh, our action tells a story. And, you know, we contrast our behavior with that of our opponents, you know, so I'll show pictures of the WTO where the opponents are riot cops, you know, with weapons. And the art actually helps to uh, tell our story, you know, that we're about life and creativity, but also the art itself talks about the issues of, uh, you know, democracy and, and uh, freedom. And you mentioned kind of the before things happen, you are gathering, you're having these art parties, you're practicing. And so when is the right time to put this into action? Or is there a right time? Uh, I mean, I mean, I, I advocate that we sent, use art throughout the movement. So if we're talking about organ, educating our community about the issues we're talking about, you know, let's use art and theater. Uh, if we're talking about involving people in our organization or group, you know, you can invite people to an art build to learn song to be part of a theater. And you can also invite people with those skills in your community to, to help co-lead that, uh, you know, and then for an actual, uh, public action, demonstration, celebration, parade, whatever, uh, you know, art is a powerful way to, you know, assert our power, demonstrate our power, and also to, to tell our story. And, and you know, it, it can also resonate with the cultures that we come out of in different communities. We can lift up uh, our cultural traditions and, and, uh, and show how they echo with our struggle. Mm. And so I mentioned in your introduction, your participation in, in major global campaigns and what made those so successful and why was art so important in those campaigns? Uh, I mean, I think the, the example I, I've, I've been pointing at, uh, I mean, it's a bit old, but we've repeated it in many other campaigns, but uh, around when the World Trade Organization, which uh, sought to concentrate uh, global power and wealth in the hands of a few through corporate globalization and uh, uh, having a, a tiny body try and make the decisions that would override states and regions ability to uh, assert their rights to environmental protection and workers rights and uh, public health. Uh, we used everything we had learned in the in the late 90s to do the organizing. So we educated people about what the WTO was uh, using arts and and uh, so these are just uh, a few of the images from that campaign. But we took everything we had learned in the the years in the anti-student sweatshop movements uh, and other movements and uh, we applied it to the WTO. So, you know, at that time, not a lot of people knew what the World Trade Organization was. So we used art and theater to, to talk about that. And uh, so this photo right here is of a, a dance and theater performance where we actually broke down specifically what the World Trade Organization was uh, and how its decisions impacted the food we eat, the water we drank, the working conditions, uh, privatization of schools, all kinds of different things. But we, we use uh, puppetry, theater, and song, and also had a couple of folks who were actually uh, impacted directly by the WTO. Uh, Chi, uh, Chi Abad, a, a sweatshop worker from Saipan who had been forced to leave for trying to organize a union and also a, a lockout steel worker 
uh, David Reed from uh, Tacoma, who was in that point involved in a strike uh, at Kaiser Aluminum, uh, impacted in part by corporate globalization. So that was how we explained what, you know, if I just stood up and talked to you about it, it would sound like a, a college economics lecture and, uh, you know, lose a lot of people. But by having people tell their personal stories and also using art, dance, and music, which we're doing here in a, a public rally in Seattle and uh, in the lead up that helped do it. And we toured up and down the Western United States and would explain the WTO, how it impacted people in concrete ways, how folks impacted tell their stories. And then we would train people in direct action, disobedience and street theater. And uh, also in the lead up, we involved uh, hundreds of people in creating the art that would fill the streets and had art builds. This is one of the, someone painting a sign for a street theater procession. And so, uh, and then also involved the people in carrying the art. So we were trying to rethink how we, how we uh, uh, took action in public. And so we called it not a protest, but we called it a festival of resistance and that we were trying to celebrate our vision of a better world while also resisting uh, the, the corporation's plans to uh, send us in the other direction. We also use arts to, to build alliances. So we work closely with the steel workers who were engaged, who were locked out and engaged in a strike at that point. And uh, so you can see a couple of the signs that they made, but it was a, a wonderful way to work across the boundaries, just saying, hey, we can make we can make signs with you out of cardboard boxes and paint. Uh, you know, and and just to say that. Art was an essential ingredient, but it was uh, combined with using our bodies with uh, mass mobilization and people power that, you know, at the end of the day, people physically blockaded the World Trade Organization from meeting and refused to move and stood up to all kinds of police violence. But uh, as the police also used theater, this was sort of how we showed up as very life affirming very positive images, uh, our messages painted across a lot of things. And in a way, the police also engaged in a, a theatrical appearance in that they looked like Darth Vader's, had armored, uh, armored personnel carriers, uh, giant canisters of pepper spray and tear gas, you know, and they, they injured a lot of people, but, uh, you know, both in Seattle and nationally, uh, we won public support even, weeks after the WTO, uh, something like 59, 60% of the public supported the protesters according to the Newsweek. So we did a good job at using both art and our direct action to, to frame, frame the conflict between people and corporate power in a way that people understood and resonated. And, and our actions led to the, the collapse of those trade talks through uh, bolstering the, the Global South delegates who were being pushed by movements in their own countries. So they refused, they, they refused to be pushed around by the rich countries, refused to make an agreement and the talks collapsed. And so their uh, corporate powers plan of how are they gonna run the world also collapsed and they had to go to uh, alternate plans. So it was a, a huge people power victory and, and art was woven throughout and played a key role in that. And every single, almost every single one of these photos, people are carrying art, carrying banners, carrying puppets, and they're smiling. What does that do to a social movement? Whereas now today we might hear about the violent side of protests. Uh, I mean, I, I think having, having song, having arts, having theater, you know, just like painting a mural in the street, it's like, you know, we're asserting our power, having a confrontation, but we're also creating a little uh, taste of the world we want. Yeah, um, one of the things we've done in recent years as a arts organizing tool is uh, take over public streets and paint them together. And so uh, in the climate justice movement, we've been doing that quite a bit. 
and I'll show a, a short video of one of the uh, examples of VAPS. And we use uh, we usually use non-toxic uh, clay paint and tempera paint. And uh, this is a video as part of the campaign to stop Line Three pipeline uh, running through the Midwest. Uh, we took over the street in front of the Oakland Federal Building and asked groups in the community to paint their solutions to uh, the Line 3 pipeline and to climate chaos and injustice. And so uh, this is a, a beautiful video that people made to, to, uh, to show that. And so we actually blockaded the street uh, led by the Thousand Grandmothers and uh, people did circle murals throughout the block and then we painted the background. <laughs> Karina says that uh, ancestors came to her and told her to go and protect her sacred site. The ancestors have spoken clearly. The people are rising up to protect the land. The ancestors have spoken. Now is the time. Go to the sacred. Stop the price. Sit not with us. The ancestors have spoken. Now is the time. Go to the sacred. Stop the pipe. Listen to the voices. The ancestors have spoken. Now is the time. Go to the sacred. Stop the pipe. Feel that in your heart. The ancestors have spoken. Now is the time. The sacred, stop the pipe. Listen to the land. The ancestors have spoken. Now is the time. Go take the sacred, stop the pipe. Find your people. The ancestors have spoken. Now is the time. Go take the sacred, stop the pipe. All together we sing. Now's the time to protect the sacred. Stop the pipelines. We sing. Sing it loud. Sing it strong. That's right. Come on. Feel that. The sacred will come on. The ancestors have spoken. Now is the time. Now is the time. The sacred sound of my blood. Hear the voices. The ancestors have spoken. All together now. Now is the time. that day was to take over the streets, hold it for the entire day and paint a giant block long street mural, which we, uh, we pressured city authorities to leave up for, for weeks. Yeah, that was really great. Um, so David, do you have any remaining thoughts and or advice you would give to those wanting to get involved in nonviolent resistance through this, through this medium? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, any one activist or organizer who wants to change the world uh, needs to put in their tool belt the, the art skills that, uh, you know, so encouraging people to develop those skills to be able to sing and lead songs, put together street theater, uh, paint art and murals together. And that, that is as key as organizing a meeting or writing a press release or planning a, a disobedience action. And that's, uh, you know, and, and as, Nonviolent direct action advocates that needs to be in our our uh, our toolbox of tactics and also the the skills involved with uh, using arts to communicate needs to be at the center of our narrative strategies if we want to win. So very excited to get a chance to talk to you and thank you so much for inviting me.
Thank you so much, David. And thank you to everyone for taking the time to watch my interview. If you want to learn more about David, his advocacy work, and other great things he is a part of, please check out the link in the description. Thank you so much again, David, for taking the time to have this important discussion with us. And I look forward to seeing more of your work. I'll see you in the streets. Thank you. If you think these conversations are important and would like to see them continue, please consider supporting NVI and the work we do by subscribing to this YouTube channel, following us on Twitter and Facebook, and visiting our website. Please consider donating to our organization and checking out our nonviolent training archive and database linked in this description. Every little bit counts to help build a more just and nonviolent world.